What's up, citizens? It's me, Colin, one of your cafe coordinators, and we're back with another Teen Science Cafe live stream. Now, before we start the stream, please make, please, please go down and smash that subscribe button, like the video, and turn on notifications with the bell, and to make sure you never miss another spicy North Carolina Museum of Natural Science video. Remember to be respectful to all of our guests in the chat as our moderators will be keeping an eye out for any inappropriate comments. Also check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight, we've got an exciting guest for you. Dr. Ryan Emanuel is an environmental scientist and community engaged scholar who leads the Eco Hydrology and Watershed Science Lab at NC State. He works with Native American tribes and other communities in NC to study environmental change through the perspective of environmental justice and indigenous rights, helping amplify their voices. Please welcome Dr. Emanuel. Thank you all so much uh, for inviting me to speak uh, this evening. I'm really excited um, that you've decided to spend your Friday evening um, at the Science Cafe, and it's a really fun topic. So November is Native American Heritage Month, uh, and I'm happy to talk with you about some of my work as a hydrologist and also as a community-engaged scholar. I'm going to go ahead and share some slides with you, and um, I will start by telling you a little bit about my work at NC State. Uh, before I do that, um, I'd like to share a little bit about my background. Uh, so I, I grew up in Charlotte. Um, I went to Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, K through 12, and I was part of the first um, class of international baccalaureate students to graduate from public schools in North Carolina. Um, so after I graduated uh, from high school, I went to college at Duke, where I majored in geology. Um, after that, I, I worked for a couple of years. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, uh, but I eventually ended up in uh, Virginia, and I went to graduate school at the University of Virginia, where I got a master's degree and a PhD, a doctorate in environmental sciences. So along the way, I've worked for the U.S. Geological Survey. That is a U.S. government agency that's in charge of measuring and monitoring water all over the, the uh, country. I've worked for private companies, but I spent most of my career working for universities. So I've been at NC State as a professor for about 10 years now. Uh, there are some photos on the screen that show some of the places where we work. Um, I do research all across North Carolina from mountains to the sea, studying how water moves through the environment, uh, what's in the water, how it impacts plants, soils, um, and even the atmosphere. Um, we also look at how, um, how other things impact water. So water quality, water quantity. We've also worked in places like Montana and Honduras. And you see photos of those, uh, some of our projects in those places up there as well. Um, I'm also a member of the Lumpy tribe. So we are the largest Native American tribe in North Carolina and the largest tribe east of the Mississippi River. There's a photo up there of our um, tribal government's headquarters in Robeson County, North Carolina. If you've ever been to Pembroke or Lumberton, uh, then you've been to Robeson County. Um, and, and I'm proud to be a Lumbee person. Uh, we really value um, our families, we value our culture, and we value place. And so one of the things that drives me to engage and interact with, um, with tribes and other Native American communities and really other communities is because I, I see that shared love of people and place. Um, and oftentimes uh, people are concerned that climate change or other kinds of environmental change uh, may, may impact those relationships that they hold to certain places in negative ways. So I try to use my, my um, skills as a research scientist and also um, just the, the, the things that I have learned being a part of the Lumbee community in order to help people answer questions that are, that are important to them. And so one of the things that we try to think about often is indigenous knowledges. So when I work in Native American communities, this is a term that comes up pretty frequently, as you can see from this word cloud of 
of terms that we use in our work. Indigenous is featured right there in, in big, bold letters. So I've got a question for you all. Um, how would you define indigenous in your own words? So if you could um, take a few moments and maybe drop some thoughts into the, the YouTube live chat, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them. So while you're thinking, um, I wanna give you uh, just some factoids about graduate studies in my field. So professors it, uh, will often have to have advanced degrees. That's usually a doctorate or a PhD. At NC State, the average time to get a doctorate, this is after your undergraduate degree, is about six years. And then uh, the university gives out about 500 of those degrees every year. And so this is work that, that you would do after you finish up your undergraduate studies in college. So just something to think about, not necessarily related to the question. So I wonder if there are some responses in the chat and if one of the coordinators wants to read some of those out. All right, so I think one response is talking about how they think it's people who are there naturally to begin with like before outside influence. Okay, um, yeah, so that, that I, I hear some good keywords there. People are there naturally. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, so indigenous people are the native people of an area. Another one says the first blank to be in any given place being native to a certain area. So I think native is a pretty big keyword people are using. Yeah. That's great. Um, so I want to hone in on that a little bit. So indigenous can definitely occur to, you know, original or naturally occurring. When it's used to describe people, um, you might be more familiar with the terms Native American, uh, First Nations, or Aboriginal peoples. So those are definitely the people who have lived in a particular place for so many generations that their cultures, languages, and more are inextricably tied to that place. For example, um, as a Lumbee person, uh, we are indigenous to the place that's now known as North Carolina. I'll show you, a, let me skip ahead and I'm gonna show you a photograph. This is our river, the uh, Lumbee River. And this is from our present day home in Robinson County. So our, our tribe actually takes its name from the, the river. So from the word Lumbee, which we believe to be the original name of the river. Um, and we're, I say that Lumbee people are a nation. We're a nation of people that, that live within the United States. So a nation within a nation. Our ancestors were indigenous peoples from various parts of present day North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. Um, they were some of the people who first greeted European settlers and explorers that landed on the shores of North America hundreds of years ago. Um, Lumbee ancestors owned and took care of vast swaths of the land that, that we call North Carolina today. They had complex societies with villages and towns that traded with each other. They intermarried and they sometimes, uh, they sometimes fought one another as well. They had technologies and life ways that allowed them to survive and thrive and adapt to the climate and the landscape um, of this place. So I'll show you, here's a couple of images that are based on early accounts of European explorers who came here to this land. Check out the elaborate farming practices in the image on the left. Look at the crops. If you're sharp-eyed, you might be able to tell that there is corn, squash, sunflowers, uh, and even more. I know that agriculture is a example of a very highly developed science. Crops like corn, beans, and squash were selectively bred for thousands of years to be nutritious and to grow in a, in a wide variety of conditions and resistant to pests and droughts and such. So if you look through this image, you know, you can see people are kind of going about their, their daily lives. They're working, they're fulfilling their roles in society. Similar on the right, you can see people inside of a town, but this town is, um, this town is, is more protected, right? They're carrying out their jobs as well. And in both towns, we see similar construct, construction styles, 
Uh, it looks like there are textiles that kind of make up the sides and the roof of the, the buildings. Uh, you can see people hunting with weapons, bow and arrow. Uh, you can see them preparing food and doing more. So both of these towns are located near the Outer Banks, and they belong to people who spoke languages in the Algonquian family. That was a group of languages that people spoke along the coast from the Outer Banks all the way up into Eastern Canada, the maritime provinces of today. Some Lumbee people uh, descend from these Algonquian speaking groups and also from other indigenous peoples of the region, including the Sheral and Tuscarora. Their traditional lands were farther west in the coastal plain and in the Piedmont. So I just used a word uh, that I want to go back to for a moment, uh, traditional lands. What do I mean when I say traditional lands? Those are the lands that indigenous people occupy before the arrival of settlers and others who remove them often forcibly from their land. Most of us have actually learned something about this in school. For example, you might have learned of the Trail of Tears where Cherokee and other Native American nations were forcibly removed from their homelands by the United States military. And they were, they were forced to places like Oklahoma. So in the case of the Cherokee, their traditional lands covered parts of present day Georgia, the Carolinas and Tennessee. And even though a large number of Cherokee people today live in Oklahoma, those lands in the Southeast would be considered their traditional territory. So similarly for other tribes, the lands that they previously occupied before being forced away make up their traditional territories. But in some cases, tribes never left their traditional territories. The Eastern Band of Cherokee, for example, maintained um, a foothold in the, in the North Carolina mountains, and they live there to this day. In Northeastern North Carolina, near the coast, the Meharan tribe is an example of an indigenous nation that continues to occupy its ancestral land, its traditional territory. So other tribes like the Lumbee live in places that were on the fringes of traditional territory, or some tribes live hundreds or thousands of miles away from their traditional territory because of colonization. So uh, I wanna ask another question. When we think about indigenous lands, we sometimes think of another term, and that term is land acknowledgement. So take a few moments and uh, think about this question. What do you think land acknowledgement means um, when I say that? So maybe you've heard of it before and you have a working idea, uh, or if you haven't, drop it in the, uh, take a moment, think about it and drop your response in the live chat. And then we'll wait a few moments and I'll ask one of the coordinators to start reading responses. In the meantime, uh, did you all know that, that an indigenous um, society in what's now America uh, had a very large city on the banks of the Mississippi River near present day St. Louis? It existed for hundreds of years between the 11th and 14th century. It was called Cahokia. So at a maximum, its population was about 15,000 people. That doesn't sound very big today, but at the time it was larger than uh, London. And across all of the Americas, North and South America, the total pre-colonial population is unknown, but by some estimates, it could have been as large as 100 million people. So this was not um, an, a, a primitive, unpopulated, uh, virgin wilderness when settlers arrived here. Okay, any responses? All right, so we've got one who says, recognizing who used to live there. Uh, another one, land that has been acknowledged as a land of indigenous peoples, acknowledgement of land that belongs to native people, and being aware of people who occupied a space before you and respecting that, acknowledging the history of an area. Awesome. Yeah, I, I like that one point about respecting um, the fact that people uh, once lived there or continue to live there who are indigenous to that land. So lots of good responses there. I appreciate that content. A land acknowledgement, um, you know, we can find various definitions. I'd call it a formal statement uh, that a school or business or government or some other institution might create to to recognize that indigenous peoples 
um, were there first. And it could be as simple as your school saying that it sits on traditional land of, say, the Tuscarora people, if you are in Raleigh. Or it could be something more detailed and substantive. Uh, maybe it's something that you develop in partnership with a Native American tribe that lives there today and describes the history of the place and the relationship that people once held and continue to hold uh, with the land. Uh, it's important to note that land acknowledgements also recognize that indigenous peoples are still here. They continue to occupy their traditional lands um, and the, or relocated lands, and they are the descendants of the original stewards and managers of this place. So speaking of place, here's a map of uh, North Carolina that shows the, the indigenous nations that are recognized by North Carolina today. So the big map in the background shows the outline of the states and the approximate locations of the eight tribal nations. You can see my tribe, the Lumbee, in southeastern North Carolina. And you also see the eastern band of Cherokee in the mountains, uh, Saponi, Halawa Saponi, and Okanichi band of Saponi kind of ring the triangle, the Meharan, which I mentioned before, up in the northeast, and then the Waccamaw Suan near Lake Waccamaw in the southeast. I also put the Catawba Nation on here to remind us that although the Catawba Nation is based in South Carolina today, just south of Charlotte, their traditional lands run along the Catawba River up into North Carolina and into the Blue Ridge Mountain uh, foothills. So it's just important to know whose land you're on. So if you're in Raleigh, you might say there, those are the traditional lands of Tuscarora people. And today, uh, our neighbors are the Halawa Saponi, the Saponi, and the Okinichi Band of Saponi. So they are descendants of Saponi-speaking peoples uh, who lived here um, hundreds of years ago, and, and the current day tribes are the descendants of those original managers and stewards um, and owners of, of this place. And they belong to the land, and they belong to the place just as much as the place once belonged to them. So I'd like to take a moment now and turn to indigenous science. And we'll go back to this image from near the Outer Banks. R think back to the technologies and practices that were documented in these two images. So in, addi in addition to agriculture, textiles, and wildlife management, indigenous peoples also uh, carefully manage their forests through the use of tools like fire. So you might not think of fire as a tool, uh, but it actually is. This is a picture of a longleaf pine savanna. That's a very unique uh, type of ecosystem because it can only survive if it experiences periodic fire. So if the undergrowth in this pine savanna doesn't burn periodically, uh, other species of trees will grow up through the canopy and they will overtake the pine trees and the pines will die. They'll be replaced by, by other species. And so over the course of time, um, native peoples who lived here used fire to maintain this landscape. So it is not, a, it is not an untouched wilderness. It's a landscape that, that really needs interaction with humans. Yes, lightning actually uh, starts fires as well, but humans who have first observed that these lightning caused fires were actually healthy for the pine savanna, use that to their advantage to make sure that those forests stayed open. And you could imagine if you're a hunter or you're a traveler, um, that is a really great uh, landscape for seeing your prey a long distance off or for just traveling without having to creep and clamber over vines and underbrush and things like that. So it's a really special type of ecosystem that involved careful management by indigenous peoples. And that's a great example of indigenous science, the science that indigenous peoples developed through many, many generations of living in a place, managing the land and managing the water and passing that knowledge on to the next generation um, orally or through different types of practices or ceremonies or cultural activities. Um, this is not a unique phenomenon to North Carolina. 
we also see uh, fire as a management tool in the West. Indigenous people use fire to ensure that places like uh, this landscape, which is in California, were hospitable. Uh, they conducted periodic burns of the landscape to ensure that edible foods and medicinal plants would continue to grow. Um, just like the longleaf pine savanna, there are certain um, there are certain plants, certain herbs, uh, vines, and things like this that require periodic fire in order to continue growing. Uh, but they also serve another important purpose: these um, occasional fires. And that is to prevent the catastrophic fires that we've seen in California and other places in the West in recent years. Okay, so you've probably seen on the news that some of the worst wildfires in recorded history have taken place in California in recent years. This is because in the US and many other countries, we've had a long, in some cases, decades or 100 year long practice of putting out every fire that occurs. And because we suppress fire for so long, we've allowed a lot of flammable material in the form of uh, leaves and needles and, and uh, dead wood to build up in forests. Indigenous peoples learned through careful observation and experimentation that it was better to burn uh, low, low intensity fire. So a gentle burn through grass every few years was better than a catastrophic, all engulfing fire that consumed everything, but only happened maybe once every 50 years or once every 100 years. And so in the West of the United States and in other countries, uh, people who today manage the land are beginning to listen to indigenous peoples who've been telling them all along that you need to burn this place and burn it every so often in order to maintain a healthy landscape they are finally starting to take um, indigenous people's knowledge system seriously on fire and other types of issues as well. Um, I also wanna point out something that was in the news recently. Um, in Central America, in the present day country of Guatemala, researchers have recently found that one of the large Mayan cities had a very sophisticated way of treating their drinking water and it wasn't just filtering it through um, sand to remove impurities. They actually used um, uh, a, a they actually use a very special uh, material called zeolite, a compound of silicon and aluminum, to create a molecular sieve. So instead of just filtering things through it it was actually capable of attracting uh, pollutants and holding those pollutants and binding them in the zeolite material. And what that did was it allowed water to flow into their reservoirs through these filters, through these molecular sieves, catch the impurity, and then the water in the reservoir would be safe to drink. And this was really important um, in a place like uh, Guatemala where you, you, know, you, you may have had a lot of naturally occurring pollutants. And if you had a very large population, there was also a high risk that you might have bacteria or other human derived pollutants getting into your water supply. So this was so clever and uh, they were doing this 2000 years ago. It's important to remember that zeolite wasn't quote unquote discovered as a water uh, filtration material or it wasn't used until the 20th century. So people thought that they had invented this great new system of, of purifying water in the 20th century. But lo and behold, the Maya people were, were doing this 2000 years ago in Central America. So just a really clever example of um, indigenous knowledge put into practice. But let's go back to North Carolina for a minute. Back in North Carolina, we also have indigenous science that helps us to think about water. Lumbee people respect water because it's a resource for us, for fishing, for transportation, for recreation, for spirituality. Our knowledge about the river helps us to take care of it. Um, traditionally, for example, we knew how close we could live to the river and how close we could build to the river uh, without risk of being flooded or without risk of contaminating the water through our own activities. Um, you know, unfortunately, we 
Um, we kind of have lost sight of that, that indigenous knowledge that tells us to give the river space, you know, don't build so close to the river. And Hurricanes Matthew and Florence dropped a tremendous amount of rain on Eastern North Carolina. And we can't discount like the impact of 20 inches of rain on flooding, but the flooding was compounded or made worse by the fact that people had built buildings and homes and businesses closer to the river than indigenous knowledge might have said was wise. You know, we thought that we could kind of engineer protections to keep the river from flooding us. Um, but our, our traditional wisdom tells us that in the end, um, nature will, will always win. You know, you can't build a levee or a wall big enough to protect you from every storm or every flood. And unfortunately, you know, that, that's what we're seeing happening. And climate change is making that worse. You know, we know that hurricanes Matthew and Florence uh, were probably made wetter, and so they drop more rain uh, because of climate change. With warmer oceans, there's more energy and more evaporation, and those storms can hold more water. Uh, if we look in other places, we see the impacts of climate change too. This is Isle de Jean Charles where um, a Native American tribe, the Isle de Jean Charles Band, has lived for centuries on the Gulf Coast of Louisiana um, on an island that you can see in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. It doesn't look like much of an island today. It's just sort of like some strips of land, but it's kind of carved up, as you can see, um, with water flowing sort of through the island in many different places. And of course, that, that turquoise house there in the foreground is just completely flooded. So um, what's causing this? Well, it's sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise, and it's also the erosion of the island by, by wave action and by storms. Here at Isle de Jean Charles, they've also kind of experienced the, the negative impacts of having um, cuts through their island for oil and gas pipelines, right? Because we have all of those oil wells out in the Gulf of Mexico and they have to have a way to move that material around. Uh, but the Isle de Jean Charles ban is in the process of abandoning their traditional homelands. They're abandoning this island and they're moving tens of miles inland to resettle and to create a new community and a new town. And so they're leaving their traditional lands behind. And when you leave those behind, you know, you're leaving a source of knowledge and a source of culture and really part of your identity behind. Uh, some people uh, have called the Isle de Jean Charles band the, the first climate refugees in the United States. So just a really interesting uh, and unfortunate impact of climate change there. Indigenous peoples understand the importance of maintaining connections between people and land and people in the water. And this is why you have seen in the news indigenous peoples at the front of resistance to fossil fuel projects, pipelines like the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. You have seen Native American tribes or individuals from Native uh, led organizations out in front. Um, of these resistance movements. And it's because they recognize that fossil fuels in particular pose um, a really scary threat to the, the, the ability to maintain your connections to place, maintain your connections to specific lands and specific waters, the places that you're indigenous to. Um, with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline in particular, although that's been canceled now, um, it's helpful to kind of look back at, at what could have been. It was designed to, um, to carry um, natural gas from the shale basins of West Virginia and Pennsylvania that's derived through fracking, a dirty uh, process that also releases a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, there's an example of one of the well, the uh, drilling rigs that's used for these wells uh, in, in the Marcellus Shale region. And then the, the path of the pipeline, some of you may have seen these maps before, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and others were going to start up in those shale basins and transport gas to places like Virginia and North Carolina. The Atlantic Coast Pipeline in particular was set to end 
right in the heart of uh, Lumbee's traditional territory. And so that's something that, that I worked on for a few years with the Lumbee tribe and the other tribes that you see named along the route there. And so there are concerns about building pipelines through your land or through your territory because it's a, it's a pretty disruptive process, as you can see from this photograph here. These are very large pipelines, not like the ones that come, hopefully not like the ones that come through your neighborhood. You know, they're not supplying houses and businesses. They're supplying enough gas for an entire state or an entire region. Um, they, they impact the flow of water across the landscape uh, because they compact soils when you do all of that excavating and refilling. But one of, the, one of the biggest risks of continuing to build pipelines and use fossil fuels is related to uh, climate change. And so this is an image from a paper that came out, a research study that came out a few years ago that looked at the economic costs of climate change. Um, how, how much equivalent would, it, would the damages of climate change be for each county in the United States? These are things like, um, what would drought do to the value of your crops? Um, how much would people not be able to work outdoors if it was extremely hot or extremely cold? How much more would you have to pay for air conditioning? Um, or how much less would you have to pay for heating if you lived up north? And this is why you see differences in color from place to place. So the red colors on the map, the warm colors show you counties in the US where climate change is expected to, to have negative economic impact. It's gonna cost people more. And the redder the color, the more of that county's income is gonna be spent dealing with the negative impacts of climate change. You see there's a few places in the US that are green. That means that they're actually expected to save money as climate change, maybe because they don't spend as much money on heating, or if it's an agriculture region, maybe they have a longer growing season, so they'll get bigger and healthier crops. But if you look at the map as a whole, there are more losers than winners. And what's more, the losers are concentrated in places where the population tends to be poorer and oftentimes tends to be browner or blacker in makeup. So African-American, uh, Latinx, and Native American populations are heavily concentrated in those red areas. This teaches us that everybody's not gonna be impacted the same by climate change. And that's a really important concept. And it's one of the reasons why indigenous peoples worldwide are often the first ones to experience these negative impacts um, are often the most vocal as well when it comes to standing up um, uh, for actions that help prevent climate change. So I, I'm happy to speak more about that or to answer other questions that you all have about indigenous science. Um, I would also like to direct you to a couple of websites. So you can see my NC State website there, uh, the first listing. And the second one is um, a website with an occasional blog that I run um, about issues related to Native peoples and the environment. So thank you all so much. And if you want to maybe drop questions in the YouTube chat, we can do that or, yeah, we can, we can discuss. So thanks. All right. So I guess we'll get started with the questions now. And as Dr. Emanuel said, please feel free to leave them in the chat. And we will try to get to as many as we can fit in the time. So first, we've got a question from Michelle Hall. And she asks, how exactly did the indigenous people here contain fires? Yeah, so th this, is, this is outside of my expertise, but would be very similar to the way that people fight fires um, today. You saw that photograph of the person walking with the torch. I mean, that's a, that's a modern day technology, um, but you know, people had uh, wooden, or shell containers, and you could have burnt, you could take burning embers around the landscape with you, and you could start small fires. Um, there are ways, and this is where it gets far from me, but there are ways to do back burns. So you have to be very careful, and you have to know exactly how the winds are blowing, and what the air temperature is like, and how, how moist or dry the, 
the litter is on the ground, the, the duff, that's the stuff you know, that's flammable sitting on top of the ground. It takes a lot of work to, um, you know, to, to carefully study all those conditions and know exactly where to drop that burning ember on the landscape. Because if you drop it in the wrong spot, you could start you know, a fire that, that hurts you or burns in the wrong direction or burns your village. Yeah, but this is why I say it's a science, right? You or I probably could not go out and successfully start or contain a wildfire, you know, but because these people had carefully observed and passed down the directions for this is how we burn, this is when we do it, you know, these are the tools that we use and we do it, you know, in this way and that way, uh, that's a science, okay? And so, uh, there are resources. In fact, there is a, there's a cool PBS video. I don't have a link to share with you, but if you search uh, for PBS videos in California, there's a, a documentary from a California tribe that describes their traditional fire management practices. And it's pretty cool. All right, thank you for that. Next we have from our Bob, how much input slash involvement do current tribal members have on natural resource management, both locally and federally? And in your opinion, do you think there's more respect for indigenous, indigenous traditions now? That's a great question. Um, so the involvement that uh, tribes have or native peoples have in the management of natural resources differs from country to country. And it also differs within the United States depending on um, what kind of recognition that tribe has. So we have uh, almost 600 federally recognized tribes in the United States, and about 60 more that are recognized by the individual states, but not the federal government. And then there are some tribes that have no recognition at all. Those tribes that have federal recognition are, are allowed and invited to participate in um, plans that the federal government draws up to manage things like national forests, um, wildlife refuges, parks. They are consulted when it comes time to make, de make important decisions about managing land or water or wildlife. Now, oftentimes those consultations, uh, they may not be they may not be thorough, they may not be meaningful, they may be just kind of like box checking exercises. So I don't want to like paint a picture that it's, uh, that it's always rosy because it's not. And a lot of the, the legal work and the hard um, organizing work that indigenous peoples do here and around the world focuses on like exerting their rights to participate in, in management. Um, my tribe, the Lumbee tribe, has partial recognition from the federal government, but it's, it's in such a way that the tribe is not allowed to participate in these uh, management decisions at the federal level. And so the tribe has, to, has to, to work in other ways if it wants to participate in the management of land or water um, or air quality or these other things. So that's a, that's a really important question, but it does not have a simple answer. And then things also get uh, really complicated when you leave the United States. One really cool example is that in New Zealand, there's a river called the Wanganui uh, that is culturally important to some Maori people. And the, the nation of New Zealand has granted the Wanganui River the status of a person so for, for uh, the Maori people for whom this river is important, culturally, that river is a relative or a person for them. But now the federal government recognizes that that river is also a person. And of course, the river can't literally talk or speak for itself in policy. So there's a committee of people who represent Maori, who represent um, the recreational interests, and who represent other interests. And that committee has to come to a consensus and speak to the government as if they're speaking for the river. So it's a really interesting management model that respects the indigenous practice of treating the river as a person. 
that's really interesting. It's nice to see some people at least are taking it with more respect and care. Next, we have a question from Bella. Do you have any advice on how we can work to incorporate indigenous knowledge into conservation and stewardship today? Yeah, that's a, that's such a good question. Um, one of the things that we have to do is, is listen to indigenous peoples. Um, it's really easy to kind of uh, write off indigenous knowledge or indigenous science as uh, superstition or just some, you know, something that is less than science because you don't learn, you, you may not learn it in a classroom at a university, right? And we have this, we have this idea that science must be something you do in a laboratory or, you know, in a, at a field site or at a computer terminal. But you have to start by remembering that indigenous peoples were practicing science and engineering and agriculture um, centuries and millennia in the past. And they passed that down from one generation to another, largely through stories and largely through sharing um, oral instructions and experiences and things like that. And so until we get to the point where we acknowledge that, hey, that's a valid way to transmit knowledge. And it and it's just as valid a way of looking at the world and interacting with the world as what we stereotypically think of a scientist as doing. Until we get there, um, you know, we 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 can't we can't um, we can't help that uh, process to happen. But the first step, I think, is acknowledging that indigenous science and indigenous knowledge is a is a valid way of thinking about and studying the world around us. Okay, thank you. In your opinion, what does a meaningful land acknowledgement look like? How can institutions like universities do impactful acknowledgements and go beyond them as well? From Brianna Johns. Thank you. That's a great question. A meaningful land acknowledgement, I think, is one that you have prepared, um, if possible, in collaboration with the indigenous people of that land, right? So let's say that you're a school in Lumberton or Pembroke, to use an example from my culture. You're sitting on Lumbee territory. So it would be really easy to say, hey, you know, we on the announcements, we acknowledge uh, that this is Lumbee territory. Okay, but, you know, did you create that statement in collaboration with Lumbee people? And do you really know what it means to acknowledge um, that, that you're sitting on what in most cases is stolen land? You know, they, we think about, we have this myth that this was empty, vacant land and we just kind of came in and planted a flag and said, this is now North Carolina, or this is Virginia. This was someone else's land. And so one example that, that I often hear about in college campuses is, you know, let's say, um, Pranav, that you had a, we were in a classroom and I walked over and grabbed your water bottle and I took it up to my podium. And I said, I acknowledge that this is Pranav's water bottle. And I just started, drinking it. And then at the end of the class, I was like, see you later. You know, you would say, yeah, that's my water bottle. And I would say, yes, I acknowledge that. And so, but you know, what do you, what do we do with that? And so when I hear some light acknowledgements, that's what I think of. Now I'm not saying, you know, we have to, you're not going to dismantle NC state and, and give the university away, right? That's probably not going to happen. What does a big institution like that do to have a meaningful land acknowledgement? In collaboration with the, the native nations, with the indigenous people surrounding you, come up with a mutual understanding about what it means to be neighbors, what it means for your school to, to occupy and benefit from land that was taken from other people. Um, these are deep conversations, right? They're not easy to have. But I think a good land acknowledgement is one that starts to starts to pick at those um, those really hard questions. And even if it's uncomfortable, we got to go there. So that's what we need for good land acknowledgements. Uh, 
All right, next from Jenna Couch, we have, in order for the indigenous peoples to gain full recognition by the federal government, what do they need to do? And do they have to give up any rights in the process? Oh, that, that, that's another good question. So I can, I'll give you an example uh, from, from the Lumbee tribe. So na Native nations in the United States um, are inherently sovereign. The government doesn't, doesn't give us nationhood. We, we are nations because we existed before the founding of the United States. You know, we were self-governing um, peoples, autonomous villages, um, coalitions, confederacies, nations, it very, you know, there are hundreds of cultures and hundreds of societies or more you know, from, from coast to coast. So what it means to have federal recognition is for the government to say, yep, we acknowledge, we acknowledge your, your sovereignty. In some respects, it's like the water bottle example, right? Except the power dynamics are very different. When the federal government acknowledges your sovereignty, um, there may be certain benefits that come with that in exchange for having taken, you know, your all of your territory. You know, we we promise to supply you with X. That's the that's the essence of a, a treaty. And we had a long history of writing treaties between the United States and Native nations. We don't do that anymore. Today, tribes are formally recognized in one of two ways. Um, they can have a bill that's passed in Congress to recognize them, or there's a, an administrative or like a bureaucratic process where you submit an application, except it's not like submitting a college application. It's like tens of thousands of pages of documentation that basically proves to the federal government that you are who you say you are. So it's a very, it, it can be a demeaning process, right? But those are the two, those are the two mechanisms today by which tribes can be recognized. Uh, there's precedent for tribes giving up certain rights for recognition. For example, uh, in, in past um, examples, when the Lumbee tribe had bills before Congress, to fully recognize them because Congress partly recognized the tribe in the 1950s and they've been trying to get another bill passed to complete that recognition. Um, recently, there have been bills that say, you know, if, if we are recognized, we won't build a casino ever. Okay, so that's an example of something that a tribe might sacrifice, right? Because there is a, a there, there is a, a precedent in many tribes across the country of getting um, revenue, oftentimes significant cash to infuse what are economically depressed areas um, through, through casinos. And so the Lumbee tribe at one point thought that it was so important enough to establish that relationship with the federal government that they would forego the rights to a casino. And so that, that's something that comes and goes from one bill to the next. But that's an, that's an example of something that a tribe could give up. All right, and in reference to one of the slides you had previously in your presentation, when we were talking about how hurricanes, now that we build really close to rivers, can actually have much more damage than what they might have had in the past. On that note, do we know exactly how uh, indigenous peoples in the past could have made structures that could withstand hurricane forces? That's a good question. So like, I'm assuming you're talking about wind and not water, because first of all, like people wouldn't build, you just would, you would just know not to build your house in the, in the floodplain. And so it was, it was technology by avoidance. For wind, if we look at those images of the houses, um, they, they appear to be made with sort of modular panels. So the, they're woven um, plant-based material, you know, woven together and put up as walls and roof. And so when I look at that, and when I look at reconstructions of that in modern day, what it tells me is that people made these lightweight structures so that, you know, if a hurricane did come, one, if it blew, if it blew their house down, you wouldn't get killed, you know, by, by these heavy log timbers falling on top of you. 
And two, it was, it was easy to rebuild. Like the heaviest, the, the biggest thing in that town were the wooden, the wooden posts that were, that were sunken into the ground as a, as a palisade to protect them from, you know, from their enemies. But everything else in that town was lightweight, probably so that if there, if there was hurricane force wind, it would be pretty easy to put everything back together again. Yeah, that makes sense. Sounds like a pretty simple solution. We've got a question from Colson Cobbs. What is the difference in the benefits between federal recognition and state recognition? And do government agencies seek tribal wisdom? Wow, you guys, these are such excellent questions. Uh, I'm really impressed. Okay, so federal recognition um, gives tribes access to um, certain benefits. Some of them are financial, some of them are legal. All right, one of the financial benefits is that, you know, that tribes can, can have the ability to go through a process where they could have a casino. Like that's a financial benefit. Uh, let me tell you about a legal benefit. There are federal laws that require agencies to engage in consultation with tribes before they, they do things like um, build the Dakota Access Pipeline through traditional tribal lands, right? And so you all know that in addition to the, the, the protests and demonstrations that were all over the news for the Dakota Access Pipeline, there were also very high profile uh, lawsuits. And many of those lawsuits involved um, whether or not the federal government had consulted with the tribes to, to ask for their input and their scientific wisdom before they made a decision on whether or not to allow that pipeline to be built. Those laws only apply to federally recognized tribes. So if your tribe is recognized by the state or if it has partial recognition like the Lumbee, um, the, the federal government is exempt from talking to you. They don't have to, they don't have to get any input at all from you before they make decisions on these kinds of things. Um, state recognition, since we have, we have many different states, there are many different versions of what that, what that looks like in terms of the relationship between the state and the tribe. In North Carolina, uh, recognition of a tribe does not require the state uh, to consult with tribes before making decisions that affect their traditional territories. You know, maybe that's something that would change someday. You know, we have a very large indigenous population in North Carolina, lots of tribes, lots of traditional territory. And you know, it's not that that um, tribal nations are trying to, to, to turn the landscape back to the way it looked in pre-colonial times, but we realized that if we're going to have a sustainable society, you know, we do need to like actually follow some of the lessons that our ancestors taught us about not taking more than you need, right? Or about leaving enough so that future generations will be able to have the same quality of life or better than we had. And so, you know, that, those really basic kind of lessons that, I mean, to be honest, they're, they're kind of like kindergarten lessons in some respect, um, are things that don't often make it into some of these high level decisions about the environment. Um, and some people think that if native voices are at the table, if indigenous voices are at the table when the decisions are being made, yeah, maybe we'll be more likely to to make decisions that are more respectful of future generations. All right, I think we have one last question. When did you decide to get involved with science? And are you doing any current research? Yeah, so I have a, a really interesting story about getting involved in hydrology. Uh, that I don't have time to go into in detail, but um, I knew that I wanted to study the environment, but that was just the environment in general. I didn't know what that meant exactly. Uh, and I had an opportunity um, immediately after high school to go and work for the US Geological Survey as a, a low level assistant 
Uh, but I took the opportunity, you know, I kind of took a leap of faith. I didn't know what this agency was or any of the people there. And I tried it out and it turned out to be super fun. Um, I learned a lot and I got to do all kinds of like, you know, just like weird things I never imagined I would get to do and being in the river and working with technology and all this stuff. And I absolutely loved it. And so I said, I want to be a hydrologist. And so I knew, I didn't know if, if I was going to be a professor hydrologist or a working hydrologist, you know, for the federal government or what. Uh, but at, later on when I was in college, I decided that I wanted to be a college professor and do research in hydrology and teach hydrology. And yes, I do research today. I collaborate with folks from NC State, UNC Chapel Hill and Duke out at the coast. And we study how salt water kind of moves into freshwater dependent landscapes and creates things like ghost forests. If you've ever seen or heard of ghost forests, um, if you haven't heard of it before, there's an NPR Science Friday documentary that was produced last year about our research on the coast. It's called The Seeds of Ghost Forests. And if you just search Science Friday and The Seeds of Ghost Forests, you can watch a 10 minute video about my research. All right. Thank you so much for your time and your knowledge. Uh, thank you guys in the audience for all your questions. And at this time, I'll turn over to Leah for closing. Thank you again, Dr. Emmanuel, and thank you all for coming. We would also like to thank the wonderful CAFE staff for allowing us to use this space on YouTube. Don't forget to follow the Teen Science CAFE and mention us on Twitter, Facebook, and tag us on Instagram. Also, keep an eye out for a following up email containing a survey or go to tinyurl.com slash survey 2 scan the QR code which will be displayed as soon as the CAFE ends and the link is also in the chat, the description of the YouTube stream. Once you complete the survey, you will receive a discount for the museum store. Be sure to register and tune in for next month's cafe on December 4th with Dr. Leslie Sombers to learn about neural analytical chemistry and how electroanalytical techniques can be used to uh, study changes in the brain chemistry of many organisms. Thank you for joining today's Teen Science Cafe. Now, I know you guys didn't do this before when Colin told you to, so make sure you go that before you close your YouTube live stream and lose my beautiful face, that you go down, subscribe, smash that like button, and hit that bell icon to never miss another saucy NCMNS video. And don't forget about filling out the short survey after the cafe. We can see who fills out the survey, so please do it. My name is Sashank. These have been your cafe coordinators and Dr. Ryan Emanuel. Stay safe this November and try not to trample people during Black Friday this year. Thank you.